la, la presentazione da casa for. allora vedete la slide da casa? Sì. siamo qui? partiamo? ok uh, so So in the last lesson, we uh, started uh, digging into the core of the standard model. Mm? And so essentially, we started introducing the uh, unified theory of uh, electromagnetic and weak interactions. Okay? And as we study already, uh, there is a, a single uh, global uh, gauge symmetry group, okay, that account for both uh, electromagnetic and weak interaction, which is the U1 hypercharge SU2 left, okay, all together. And this is indeed the gauge symmetry of the electroweak sector of the standard model. Then, of course, we have to merge these together with the SU3 color of QCD, okay? And this will be, of course, the full picture for the standard model. We will focus on the electroweak sector. So let me just recap a few things that we, uh, summarize a few things that we already discussed last time. So, uh, first of all, uh, the SU2 left uh, gauge group, okay, this with transformation of this kind here where alpha are the space-time dependent parameter of the transformation, and T are the generators, which are essentially given in terms of the three power matrices. Mm -hmm. And um, with the weak isospin eigenstate are in analogy to the strong isospin uh, eigenstate, come in the form of a doublet that we call the weak isospin doublets. And each doublet contains two leptons or two quarks, which differ by weight unit of electron charge. Okay? So for the Fermi, we have the electroneutrino, neutrino, muon, neutrino, muon, tau, neutrino, tau, and tau lepton. And these are the three uh, weak isospin doublets. Each doublet is assigned a, a weak isospin one half, and the two components of the doublet are distinguished by the third component of the weak isospin, which, is, which we also call the weak charge, okay? It's essentially the, 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 weak, the charge of weak interactions, which can be either plus or minus one half, in accordance to the uh, electric charge. For the quarks, we have uh, three additional uh, isospin doublets, okay? U D prime, C S prime, T B prime, where uh, these are, of course, the weak eigenstate of quarks. So the prime means combination or mixing of uh, downtight quarks, the way we've already started. Mm -hmm. uh, also in this case, of course, the isospin is one half, and then we distinguish the two components by plus or minus one half, so the third component. Then we also have the right uh, left fermions, the right charged uh, leptons and right handed uh, quarks. Um, and those guys do not take part to the charged carrier weak interaction as we know, because charged carrier weak interaction only couples with left handed uh, fermions and right handed anti fermions. Okay? So, in a sense, these are uh, ghost particles uh, concerning the charged carrier weak interactions. Then there is uh, another gauge group, okay, the U1 hypercharge, which is uh, defined here, where we have to introduce this new charge, the, the weak hypercharge, capital Y, okay. Uh, and so, uh, and the two, of course, are linked by this uh, relation that we introduced, okay. So the hypercharge is twice the difference between the electric charge and the third component of the weak axis speed. And so we can assign a value of the hypercharge to any of these uh, particles here, okay? And in particular, the gauge invariance of the uh, electroweak Lagrangian over this global U1 SU2 group requires that the hypercharge is the same for both members of each weak isospin doublet, okay? So it is minus one for the leptons, plus one third for the quarks, etc. Now, that, then, of course, through this relation, we can also assign hypercharge values to uh, the right-handed uh, fermions. Now, uh, the weak isospin symmetry group uh, um, requires the uh, introduction of three new gauge bosons, okay, which, as we see today, are introduced through, in the standard way, through the covariance derivative into uh, the Lagrangian density. This we call the W1, W2, and W3. And in particular, uh, a specific combination of W1 and W2 corresponds to the physical W plus and W virus weak bosons, okay? Although at this level, everything is massless, okay? The W3 is something different. It is related, as we see, uh, to, as we saw already, to a, um, a neutral 
switched current. So indeed, we can define three corresponding currents, the J1, J2, and J3, uh, where phi L is uh, one, F, one of the possible uh, regardless spin doublets, and in terms of the three generators of SQ2L, so the three Pauli matrix, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, okay? And we also show in the blackboard that uh, we can reconduce each of these currents in the familiar V minus A uh, form, okay? So the other currents. And in particular, as we also shown, uh, the uh, specific combination of the first two, so J1 and J2, properly combined, corresponds to the, indeed, the, the uh, weak uh, charged currents, okay? So indeed, uh, once you develop uh, your, your algebra, you get this uh, familiar V minus A uh, charged current for the W plus and the W minus. Mm -hmm. Whereas the J3 is a neutral current, okay? Now, back to the uh, weak hypercharge, okay? Also in this case, we have to introduce a, a gauge boson. In this case, just one that we call B mu. Mm -hmm. And this gauge boson corresponds also to an additional current, which is the, the current for the hypercharge. Uh, which is given here, okay? It, it has a standard vector, uh, four vector uh, structure, and it is completely democratic with respect to left handed and right handed fairness, okay? So we have essentially all four possible combinations for the two uh, components of the weak charge spin doublets, okay? Each coming with a specific value of the uh, hypercharge, and each, of course, uh, multiplied by the specific coupling of this new gauge symmetry group, which is G prime. Okay. Now, we also found that uh, the physical uh, photon and Z boson are obtained by a mixing, through a mixing of the B and the W3, so these two neutral current uh, gauge bosons, through a rotation matrix, which is driven by one single parameter, which is the Weinberg mixing angle, theta Weinberg. And in the same manner, we can also develop the electromagnetic current and the current for the Z boson, okay, as the combination of the uh, weak hypercharge and J3 currents, okay? And as we derived last time from the first combination, we obtain uh, the relation between the three coupling constants, okay? E, which is the electric charge, so the coupling constant of the electromagnetic interaction, G, which is the coupling constant of the charged current with interaction, and G prime, which is the charged current of this uh, sort of uh, uh, this new uh, gauge field, which is uh, the, the hypercharge. Mm -hmm. All these, as you see, are always um, given in terms of this uh, Weinberg angle. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, what about the JZ? Okay. So we introduce, first of all, the coupling constant for the Z boson as G divided by cos uh, the, uh, theta W. And then we derive uh, step by step also the, the full expression of the current for the uh, exchange of neutral uh, Z bosons, which can be given in two different ways, okay? So as a combination of left-handed and right-handed vector currents, in this case, the coupling are CL and C right, which are different. And this means that indeed parity is also violated in the uh, neutral current sector because indeed the coupling for the left handed and right handed are different. Although the Z boson can interact with both. Okay. And this is a big difference with respect to the, to the Ws. Or we can express this current now in terms of the combination of a vector current and an axial vector current. Okay. Uh, in this case, the coupling constant, constants are different are CB for the vector current and CA for the axial vector current. And the two, of course, are equivalent. Mm -hmm. Now, this was our uh, arriving point last time. So let's now, oh, no, uh, yeah, something more. Uh, yeah, this we already saw. So the values of these four coupling constants are completely determined once we fix the value of the uh, theta Weinberg angle, okay? So once we fix essentially the sign of this theta W, and these are the expression that we derived last time for these four coupling constants. The value we can now uh, calculate through these relations here, once you know the, the value of the theta Weinberg, and you can now tabulate for all your elementary uh, fragments. Mm -hmm. So for the neutrinos, okay, okay, use the charge, the component of isospin, uh, hypercharge for left and right handed, and then we have here the four coupling constants, okay? And same for, for the charged cap, for the charged leptons, uh, the uptight quark and the downtight quark. And what uh, results from this table is that the Z boson couples, uh, the coupling are the same for all three generations, okay? So it is, uh, CA is plus one alpha for electron neutrino, one neutrino, tau neutrino, et cetera. 
okay? For plus one up, four up, charm, and top, okay? Okay, so this was indeed our arriving point. Let's now uh, proceed from this point. So, um, as we just said, in the ultra-relativistic limit, only two helicity combinations are uh, non-zero, okay, for uh, the um, decay of a Z-boson into a pair of fermion and fermion, okay? One is where the Z-boson decays into a left-handed fermion and a right-handed anti-fermion, and in this case, the capping constant is CL. And the other one is where the Z-boson decays into a right-handed fermion and a, a, a left-handed anti-fermion, which is also possible for the, for the Z, but with a different capping constant, CR, okay? And so we can denote the two matrix elements for these two decay processes as ML and MR. Clearly, since both things can happen, then we have to merge them together, actually to average them together. So we can estimate, as usual, the spin average uh, matrix element squared, okay, for the generic decay of the z boson into a terminal defendant pair, okay, which is essentially given by the sum of the square of these two matrix elements. Hmm? Now, with some algebra, one can show that these uh, objects can be expressed uh, in terms of the uh, coupling constant, either CL and CR, or CB and CA in this way, okay? Where also the square of the Z mass and the square of the Z coupling constant uh, appear, okay? Now, as we did already for the W uh, uh, two weeks ago, we can now put this object into the gen general form of the uh, decay rate, the, from the Z in this case, so we just put it here, we integrate over the, uh, uh, the solid angle in the center of mass, and at the end we obtain some expression, which is given here, okay? GZ squared, MZ divided by a constant, and then we have the sum of these two coupling constant squares. Now, uh, we can now compare these with the ex similar expression that we derived two weeks ago for TW, they came into whatever left on end corresponding in neutrino, okay? So you see the structure is the same. We have the square of the coupling constant, we have the mass of the boson, we have the same constant in the denominator, but in this case, we have in addition the term including the coupling constants, okay? Again, this you can express either in CB and C, in terms of CBSCA or in terms of CL and CR, okay? With some algebra in between. Now, uh, once we have this guy here, we cannot put numbers inside, and so calculate indeed, for instance, the decay width of the Z for instance, for the channel into electron and uh, electron neutrino and electron anti neutrino. Okay, so let's take this as, a, as an example channel. So the expression, the general expression that we found is this one. Let's now put numbers. So as we saw last time uh, in natural units, the ZGZ uh, cap coupling is of the order of 0 0.74. The mass of the Z we know is 91 GV, which is a constant. And then we take from the table the values of the uh, CB and CA coupling constant for the neutrinos, okay? So if you go back here to the table, indeed you see that it is uh, CV and CA is both plus one half, okay? So we take them, we square them, we put it here, we calculate this number and we obtain 167 NEV. So in other words, what we found here is that the uh, partial decay width of the Z boson into this specific decay mode, which is into neutrino and neutrino, is 167 NEV. Okay, then of course the Z boson can decay in many other possible ways. And so what we want to do is to calculate the total width by summing up all the possible contributions, so all the possible partial decay widths. Okay, uh, in practice the Z can decay in everything except for the top quark, which is clearly uh, heavier than the Z itself. Okay, so it can decay on the three uh, neutrino channels, on the three charge adaption channels, and then on five different uh, quark types, quark anti quark pairs. So for the neutrinos, uh, this is the way, the width that we just calculated, 167 NEV, and this we calculate by three because we have to take into account the three generation, electron neutrino, mu neutrino, tau neutrino. Similarly, we do for the charged leptons, okay? So three times that of the electron positron. And then we have three times that of the Z into the down type quarks, which is DD bar, SS bar, BB bar. Mm -hmm. And only two times the width in the K in the up type quarks, which are UU bar, CC bar. We cannot have TT bar because this is too heavy and energy will be, energy conservation will be violated. And then on top of this, we have an additional factor of three, which accounts for color conservation in the decay into quarks. 
because uh, uh, these uh, quark anti quark pairs have to be colorless. So add a yellow anti yellow, green anti green, blue anti blue, red anti red. Okay? And so you have three possibilities, so you have to take into account this factor of three. Now, if you measure all this quantity and you sum in this master formula, you obtain indeed the full decay width of the Z problem. Okay. The first one has to be more careful because when you look now at the decay into quarks, uh, quarks can also radiate gluons. Okay. So if, in order to get a more precise prediction for the full width, decay width of the Z, one has to take into account also the possibility that quarks radiate gluons. So one can uh, put here a um, correction at first order, so including the uh, emission of one single blue one, okay? And it is already accurate enough. Of course, you can expand these uh, and having many more orders in this expansion, but already if you limit yourself to the first order correction, then you are already done essentially with the, your uh, prediction. So when you consider all these together, you get 2.5 GV as the total width of the Z, as we already seen uh, last time, okay? And this is in perfect agreement with the, the experimental value. Okay? This means that the higher order for QCD corrections are, uh, in a sense, negligible. Okay? So of course, they are there. You can radiate two gluons, three gluons, whatever, but the contribution becomes smaller and smaller. OK. So now we have a full picture of the uh, decay modes and decay branching ratios for the Z into all possible uh, modes. Okay, so here we see the possible decay modes. So the partial width for the charged leptons is uh, more or less 84 MeV for each of them. So we can take the average. So the third row here is just uh, uh, the average account for either the lepton or the moon or the tau. Okay, they are the same because they are, uh, the coupling is the same for all three generations. Okay. And this is the branching ratio, which is essentially something 3.36% uh, for each leptonic, <laughs> charged leptonic <coughs> decay mode. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Then we have the adronic mode. So this accounts for all possible decays into four anti quark pairs. Okay. So they are all put here together here. So uh, the width is uh, 1.7 uh, GD. Okay. So it's the biggest part, of course. And the branching ratio is over about 70%. Okay. So in 70% of the cases, the Z bottom will decay into four particles. Okay. In any of the four particle pairs. Then we have the uh, so called lambda invisible. So that is the neutrino sector. Okay. Which uh, sum up to something like 500 MeV for the width, which is three times the uh, 167 that we uh, calculated before, because we have three generations. And the branching ratio 20%. Of course, when you sum up all these branching ratio, you obtain 100% and a total width of 2.5 G. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, so the, the, the letter with theory provides, of course, a certain number of parameters which have to be determined experimentally. Okay, and these are the mass of the W, the mass of the Z, the theta Weinberg angle, uh, the Fermi constant, or uh, and also even the electromagnetic constant. Okay, alpha electromagnetic. And of course, the quantity have been measured in many different experiments in the past case, and the precise measurement have been performed, especially at the lab. Okay, the electron positron collider that was CERN for the electron collider and a Tevatron, uh, which was a proton-antiproton collider that operated at Fermilab until a few years ago. Mm. So altogether, uh, the experiments at LEP and at Tevatron provide precise measurement for all these parameters. Mm. Now, uh, it is important to say that uh, they are not, all, not all of them are independent, but only three of them are independent. Okay? So if you measure three of them, you can uh, obtain the other two through simple relations. For instance, the mass of the W is related to the alpha electromagnetic, the Fermi constant, and the theta W this way. Okay, it's a nasty formula, but at the end, if you measure alpha electromagnetic, if you measure GF, and you, if you measure theta W, you obtain your uh, standard model prediction for the mass of the W. Okay, and similarly, the mass of the W and the Z are uh, related by this simple relation in terms of the cosine of the theta Weinberg. Okay. So if you know the mass of the one, you can, and you know that the Weinberg, you can calculate uh, or you can predict the mass of the other. Now, things are not uh, as simple as one can think, uh, because if you now measure, so back to this guy here, suppose that you now measure precisely the mass of the Z, and this has been done at lab, for instance, 
and you also have a precise measurement of the theta w, okay, then you can compare your standard model prediction of the w mass with the experimental value, okay? And the standard model prediction for the W mass is 79.937 something hmm, GV to be compared with the experimental value that, as you know, is above 80, so is 80.38 GV, okay? So clearly the two are in the right order, okay? But you have to consider also the uncertainty. The uncertainty is pretty small. In fact, when you now consider them also taking into account uncertainty, there is a strong, uh, uh, tension between these two of the order of 30 sigma, okay? So the values are close, but the uncertainty are very small. So the tension is very significant, 30 sigma. So now the question is, uh, is this uh, a failure of the standard model? No, of course, as you can imagine. This is actually an additional success of the theory because the theory predicts also the so-called quantum loop corrections to uh, your mass. So essentially the standard model tells you that uh, the mass of the W, for instance, is not just the bare mass of the W, but you have to take into account also vacuum polarization effects, okay? So the, uh, the W can also, uh, within the uncertainty principle, can also fluctuate into a top anti-boson, for instance, or into a W and an X boson. And so you have to take into account all this contribution if you want to have the full correct mass of your W, okay? And the standard model indeed predicts all this contribution to be there. Okay, and so you have to take into account all of them if you want to really compare your prediction with experimental results. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, if you take now into account all these, uh, okay, the first of these, uh, the, lower, the lowest order of these uh, loop corrections, the mass of the W is the, the mass of the bare W plus a correction which is quadratic in the mass of the top fork and a correction which is logarithmic in the mass of the Higgs boson plus higher order contribution, okay? So you have to calculate all these terms in order to provide a prediction which is comparable with experimental data. Mm -hmm. A and B here are um, calculable constants, okay? So um, the direct observation of the effects of quantum correction provides an impressive validation of the electrolyte sector. So uh, it is, of course, a very good news that the experimental value is different from the bare value because we have to take into account these corrections, okay? So this is an, indeed an impressive validation of the standard model. Furthermore, uh, since the electro or weak measurements are so precise uh, to be sensitive to quantum correction, they can strongly constrain model of physics beyond standard model. Suppose that there is a new physics beyond the standard model and so new unknown particles can also contribute to these loops, okay? And so if you take them into account, at the end, you get uh, a prediction for the W mass, which is uh, different from the experiments, okay? And this will be a clear sign of new physics beyond standard model, okay? And this you can do because we are now in the head of precision, okay? We can measure these uh, objects so precisely that we can be sensitive to possible contribution of new physics, hmm? which are not found at the moment, by the way. Now, back to this uh, correction formula. Uh, so the mass of the W is the bear, then we have this quadratic term uh, of the top mass, and then the logarithmic dependence of the mass of the Higgs. Of course, this term is much stronger than this guy here, okay? Uh, so it is essentially the dominant contribution, the one that comes from the square of the mass of the top, okay? And so what can, one can invert this reasoning and say, okay, we measure the W mass precisely, okay? And so we can infer from this relation what could be the standard model prediction for the mass of the top quark, okay? And in fact, this was done in the early 90s and before the top quark was discovered. And it turns out that indeed uh, the expected mass of the top quark was in the range of 175 GV, okay? So huge, as you know, as we discussed already several times, uh, and so very, very difficult to detect. Hmm? You need uh, two things in it. An extremely powerful accelerator to provide enough central mass energy in the collision, and an extremely sophisticated detector, okay, to uh, reconstruct uh, the decay product of the uh, top core production in the collision. Okay. Now this was achieved in 1994. Okay, so after uh, uh, 15, 20 years uh, after the discovery of the bottom core. Okay. 
So the, 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 the gap in mass is really huge between the two. And this was possible indeed only at the uh, Tevatron uh, Collider at Fermilab. So the Tevatron Collider, as I was uh, mentioning before, was a proton anti proton collider at a central mass energy of 1.8 TeV. Okay? So it was indeed the most energetic accelerator before the advent of the Radon Collider. Mm -hmm. So we had a proton beam circulating in one direction, an anti proton beam in the other direction, and two uh, experiments. So for you know, two collision points, which are called CDF, were called CDF and D0. Okay, you see here an example of the CDF uh, detector, uh, and you see how it is big, large, and complex. And it is indeed what you need in order to make this kind of discovery. Okay, uh, both experiments, actually, both CDF and D0, observed the top quark. Okay, but CDF uh, had a higher sensitivity in both of the first to publish. Okay, so at the end, D0 had to confirm the discovery already done by CDF. Mm -hmm. So how was the uh, top discovered? This is essentially the process. So we are colliding a proton and antiproton. So essentially, we are colliding a bunch of quarks and antiquarks. Okay, the two uh, collide, and in a few, very few cases, okay, they can, in the, the annihilation of a cuckoo bar, so light quarks, but high energetic can produce a TP bar pair. Okay? Then the T decays immediately, immediately, 10, 10 to the minus 25 seconds into a bottom quark and a W. Okay? The bottom quark generates a jet of hadrons in the detector. Okay? And this happens twice. We have to expect two jets, one for the top and one for the top. And the W can decay in any of its possible decay modes. So it can be leptonic, it can be into quarks. Can be any, any of the, the known possible decays. So at the end, the game is to reconstruct the invariant mass of all these objects here, okay, where B means a jet of many atoms and also this game, also B bar. Mm -hmm. And consider that you also uh, have neutrinos which escape the detector. So you have to take that into account as missing energy or missing momentum in your uh, event reconstruction. Okay. So people did all this, okay, in 94, and uh, they reported here the experimental data of the invariant mass of for this final state, okay? And there was indeed a bump at 100, 100, uh, 170 something GD, okay? This was indeed the, the discovery of the top quark, of the last quark, essentially, of the, of the model, okay? So the top quark is by far the heaviest uh, object, elementary particle, the standard model. It is heavier than the Higgs, which is heavier than the Z, which is heavier than the W. And today, the world average uh, value for the top mass is 173.21 GV, the one you find in your PDG booklet. Now, uh, due to its large mass, of course, the lifetime of the top quark is extremely short, called the 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So it decays immediately as soon as it is produced, and so it can never take part to any bound state, it can never be part of a hadron, okay? So indeed, there is no way to observe a resonant production such as the charmonium or the bottomonium for the top quark. So TT bar state, TT bar state are not bound, not exist, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, let's now try to construct uh, the missing piece of our discussion, which is the Lagrangian density of the electroweak theory. Okay, we did it for the electromagnetic interaction, we did it for the QCD, let's now do it for the electroweak, the unified theory. Mm -hmm. So the Lagrangian density of the unified electroweak theory can be obtained in the usual way. Okay, so we start from the Lagrangian of a pre fermion. Actually, in this case, it's not a real fermion, but it is a, a weak adjusting doublet of fermions. And we require its invariance under the local U1, SU2 phase transformations, okay? So in order to make the uh, Lagrangian um, gauge invariant, you know, you know the trick, we have to substitute the standard derivative with the covariant derivative, which in this case have three uh, contribution, the standard derivative, and now two contribution arising from the two different gauge group that take part to the uh, symmetry of the Lagrange, okay? So this one is the uh, one related to the SU2 left, okay? 
where we have these, uh, the W bosons introduced for the, here in the, in the Lagrange. And this is the one due to the uh, E1 hypercharge, where we now have this B boson introduced in the Lagrange. Okay? So uh, the price to pay to have a uh, electroweak Lagrangian uh, gauge invariant is that we have to introduce four gauge, new gauge bosons. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> as you know, these gauge bosons have to transform properly in order to preserve the gauge invariance. Okay? So for the B, it is simple. It is just the same kind of uh, transformation that we have already for the photon in QED. Okay? For the W, it is a bit more complicated. We have an additional term with the structure constant of the electronic theory. And this resembles pretty much uh, the transformation of the gluons, if you remember. Okay? Uh, and the reason why this is more complicated is uh, SU2 left as any SU2 with transformation is uh, non abelian like SU3 core. Okay? And, it, and this is the reason why we have to have this additional term in the transformation rule for our gauge bonds. Okay? <clears throat> non abelian means that the generators do not commute, as you know, and the, the power matrix do not, of course. <clears throat> So we start indeed from the uh, free Lagrangian for a, a weak isospin doublet of fermions. And we introduce our covariant derivatives. And this is what we get here, OK? So we have the covariant derivatives term. And then we can put aside the mass term for the leptons. Mm -hmm. What are we missing? What are we missing? What is the missing piece? Yeah. As we did already for QED and QC. Hmm? Oh. At the end, we add always a piece at the, at the very end, okay? For QED, it was in terms of the uh, electromagnetic uh, strength tensor. Hmm? So we, are, we need to, to add again. Yeah. Uh, OK, so <laughs> uh, the kinetic term of the gauge bosons, right? So minus 1 half on 4 WW and minus 1 4 BB. B, w mu nu, w, these are tensors, OK? These are not gauge bosons, these are tensors, OK? And all this sector of the Lagrangian is called the Young Mills term, OK? So we have the kinetic term of uh, the, the um, let me go back. Kinetic term of uh, the fermion, which is in the standard derivative. We have the interaction term of the fermion with the W boson, the interaction term of the fermion with the B boson, the mass term of the fermion, and the kinetic term of the boson. Okay, the boson. Okay. And again, to preserve the gauge invariant, also these objects have to transform properly. So the B mu nu transform uh, such a, uh, just as the B e mu nu, so the, the same tensor of QED. Mm? For the W, it is a bit more complicated, again, because uh, the SU2 left is not abelian. Okay, so we have the similar kind of transformation rule as we studied already for uh, the gluon strength tensor, the core strength tensor in QCD. Okay, now we can put everything together and we have the uh, supposedly uh, electroweak Lagrangian density. Okay, so we have everything together. Kinetic term of the leptons, interaction term of the leptons with the gauge boson, the mass term of the leptons, the mass, uh, the kinetic term of the gauge bosons. Okay. What is missing here, and uh, as is what also missing in QAD and QCD Lagrangian, is the mass term of the gauge bosons. Right? We don't have a mass a quadratic term in the gauge bosons here. For QAD, it is okay because the photon is massless. For QCD, it is also okay because the gluons are massless. But now we have a problem. Because we know that the W's and the Z the bosons are not massless, they are actually quite heavy. Okay? So indeed there is something missing in this Lagrangian. This cannot be the final Lagrangian of the standard model, okay, of the electric sector. So although it is based on the local gauge symmetry, and so it has been obtained formally in the correct way, okay, the Lagrangian density above is not yet the Lagrangian of the standard model. Because the gauge bosons, uh, W123 and B, are still massless. And in addition, they do not correspond to the physical electroweak bosons, the photon, the Z, and the W. Not so much, okay? And in fact, this can, see, can, can be seen immediately by the absence of mass terms. 
in the Lagrangian for this process. Okay, so there is something clearly missing here. Hmm? So in other words, uh, the local gauge principle that we have been using for QED and QCD, okay, which is also necessary to describe correctly any uh, fundamental interaction to ensure that the theory is renormalizable, hmm, works only for massless bosons. Okay? So the gauge, the gauge principle is perfect for QED and it is perfect for QCD because the gauge bosons are massless. But here we have a big problem to solve. Okay? because, of course, the W and the Z are massive. Mm -hmm. However, the photon is still massless, and it is part of this game, because we are talking about unified electroweak interaction. Okay? So in other words, uh, the electroweak model needs to be supplemented with a mechanism that generates the large masses of the W and Z while leaving the photon massless. Mm -hmm. And this is achieved by the Higgs mechanism that we are now going to study. Okay? So the X mechanism, as we study today and tomorrow, will generate the masses of the W and the Z, Z while keeping the photon massless. Okay. Any question to this point? Okay. Okay. So let's start uh, introducing the Higgs mechanism. Okay. It's a bit uh, long story. We we'll start today, but we we'll complete tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So let me start with a, a few basic things. Actually, first of all, let me uh, recap uh, what we already studied a week uh, months ago about uh, quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. So in quantum field theory, each elementary particle, so leptons, quarks, bosons, whatever, is associated to a quantum field. Mm -hmm. Or to be more precise, ele elementary particles are generated as excitations or quanta of the corresponding field. So the electron arises as an excitation of the electron field, the Higgs boson as an excitation of the Higgs field, etc. And if you remember, in quantum field theory, the field acts on the space of state by creating and destroying uh, uh, particles through specific operators, which are creation and annihilation operators. So this is our field. And in this sort of Fourier transform, uh, it introduced the annihilation and creation uh, operators in its definition. So for instance, if you have a state with n particles, you apply the annihilation operator, you end up with a state of n minus one particle, you destroy one particle. Oppositely, if you apply the creation operator, you create one particle, so you start from n, you end up with n plus one particle, okay? And one can construct in this way uh, a multi-particle state or function, okay, uh, just by applying recursively the construction, the creation operator, starting from the vacuum state, okay. So the vacuum state is zero, and then you apply all the times that you need your creation operator to create your multi-particle wave function, okay. That in the most general case is the one you see here where we have uh, n1 particle with momentum p1, n2 particle with momentum p2, and n particle with momentum p1, okay? This is the most general way of, uh, you can describe a physical state in, in uh, quantum field theory, okay? So applying rec rec recursively the creation operator starting from the vacuum state. Now, uh, there is something that I didn't tell you at the time, and I will tell you now. And it is another fundamental quantity that we have to take into account in quantum field theory, that is the potential energy of the field. So in other words, the amount of energy which is stored in the field. Hmm? We call this uh, V, V, V phi. Hmm? This energy is a function of the value of the field itself, you see here, okay? And in particular, uh, it turns out that each field has to have at least one level of minimum energy, the ground state, if you like, okay? But this can be realized in different ways, okay? So let's consider the most common way, okay? So since, as we said, in quantum field theory, particles are excitation of the field, it is reasonable to assume that the vacuum state corresponds to the absence of particles, so to the absence of excitation, right? If you don't have excitation, you are in your ground state. And so this corresponds in quantum field theory in a state where there are no particles. Okay, and this is indeed the case for fields which are associated to the fundamental interaction. So the photon field, the gluon field, the weak boson field, and also the elementary fermions, the lepton field, the quark field, they all behave in this way. 
they all have a level of minimum energy, which corresponds to non-excitation, and so with two non-particles. Mm -hmm. And it is, as you see here, the minimum of this, this so here you see the, the energy as a function of the field value itself, okay? The minimum corresponds to uh, the point where the, the value is, uh, or the field is zero, okay? So this is the minimum level that we call the true vacuum state, where there are no particles, and the field is zero. Now, uh, since, as you know, nature has a, a spontaneous tendency okay, to reach its level of minimum energy, okay, those fields, so the photon, the gluon, the W, the Z, the electron, the quark, okay, all these fields tend to remain in this uh, uh, true vacuum state, or the lowest energy state where the field is zero. Okay? And uh, since this is the natural tendency, it turns out that uh, uh, if nothing happens, all these fields are set to zero everywhere in the space-time, everywhere in the universe, okay? <clears throat> of course, the only exceptions are quantum fluctuation or vacuum polarization effect, if you like. This can always happen within the uncertainty principle. So even if you are in the lowest energy state here in the true vacuum, quantum fluctuation is still possible. So you can, for a very short time, generate pairs of particles which are then reabsorbed, okay? These are oscillations, say, fluctuation in your minimum, in your ground state. Of course, only if we provide externally energy to the field, then we can excite the field, and so the field reacts by creating particles. Is that clear? Now, as I said, most of the field that uh, concern us are this kind here. Okay? However, there is a different category of fields, okay, where the absence of particles does not coincide with the level of minimum energy. Okay, so as you can see here now, the dependence of the potential energy with the value of the field has a different uh, shape. Mm -hmm. In this case, one can define two different types of vacuum. The true vacuum, which is the same as before, okay, so the field is at its minimum energy level, but in this case, there are particles. Okay, and the false vacuum, okay, where now uh, there are no particles, the field is at zero, but it is, does not correspond to the level of minimum energy. Okay, and you see here in the picture, so the false, minimum, the false vacuum is here, where the field is indeed zero, okay, and so there are no particles here, but this is not the lowest energy state. The lowest energy are these two here, okay, where you can have particles. So it's a diff completely different behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, if the field is in one of its lowest energy levels, so for instance here or there, okay, so in one of the two vacuum states uh, <clears throat> where particles are present, then one needs to provide a certain amount of energy to the field in order to allow the field to jump to this uh, hill, okay, and to get to the false vacuum, okay? So naturally, the field stays in the minimum energy level, which which has particles itself. If you want to put it here, you have to provide energy to the field, okay? But as you can also imagine from this picture, uh, this uh, false vacuum is unstable, okay? Because it is not the lowest energy state, okay? So clearly, uh, things tend to spontaneously decay into the lowest energy level, okay? So this vacuum here, this false vacuum is unstable, and uh, a minimal quantum fluctuation is sufficient to roll down the field to one of the two medium, okay? Which can be more than one, more than two, can be also infinite, as we will see. Now, the Higgs field that we will go to study now belongs to this second category, okay? So it occupies spontaneously a true vacuum state, and one of the possible infinite ones, okay? Uh, and its value, so it's non-zero, okay? Its value can be, in this simple two-dimensional example, either minus b or plus b, but sure it is not zero. Mm -hmm. And this, is happen this happens spontaneously, so the Higgs field is there, in this uh, true vacuum, okay? And these have two important consequences. First of all, its value is non-zero in the whole space, it is either plus b or minus b, mm -hmm. and so the Higgs field uh, fields fill the entire universe with a non-zero expectation value. This is the first conclusion. The second, all particles which are sensitive to its presence 
have always a certain probability to interact with the Higgs field because it is non zero, it is always there, always present. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it was about uh, quantum field theory. Okay, now we will make use of this, of course. Now, from the physical point of view, why the hell people had to introduce the Higgs boson in the, in the theory? Okay. So before the origin of the mass, there was a, another fundamental problem that had to be solved even before. Okay, and the problem is similar to the one that we already discussed uh, about the introduction of the natural currents. If you remember, the natural currents were introduced because the E plus E minus into W plus the uh, minus process was violating unitarity. Okay. Uh, if you only consider the charged current uh, process, which is a T-channel with an uh, exchange of a neutrino, or the standard electromagnetic with a exchange of a photon. So in order to recover your good behavior on the cross-section of high energy and to avoid the divergence, we have to introduce, you have to introduce the neutral currents, okay? A neutral Z boson with an additional diagram that was uh, interfering with the equilibrium with the other two and providing the correct behavior of the cross-section. This we studied already. Now, for the Higgs, it is the same problem. In this case, uh, the process the, uh, which is incriminated is uh, the W plus W minus into W plus W minus scattering. Okay. In fact, it turns out that if you uh, one consider only these three diagrams, this process uh, diverges at large energy. So when the center of mass energy goes above one TB. So what we have here, this is a scattering of E plus E minus either electromagnetic because the two have electric charge, so to the extent of the photon or weakly to the exchange of a Z. We know that the WWZ vertex is, of course, uh, existing and uh, contributing. This is a T channel, this is an S channel, and then we can also think about uh, a four point uh, interaction between the, the, the values, okay? This is all we had in hand before the introduction of the Higgs. And if you consider only those diagrams, then again, you have this violation of unitary. <coughs> To be more precise, and this is a crucial point, so keep attention here, the diverging amplitudes originate from the scattering of longitudinally polarized W bosons. Okay, so not in general for unpolarized, but for longitudinally polarized W bosons. Since longitudinally polarized states do not exist for massless particles, if you remember the uh, photon can only have two transverse polarization states, but not a longitudinal one, okay, then, the unitarity violation in the WW scattering can be associated with the fact that the W bosons are massive. Okay, so there is something missing in the theory. Okay, that we have to introduce in order to recover the full behavior, the correct behavior of the cross section, which is now related to the fact that the Ws are massive, because only massive particles can have a longitudinal polarization too. If they are massless, like the photon, they move at the speed of light, and it can only have two transverse. Uh, the, but not longitudinal, so not in the direction of motion. Okay. So again, as we did already for the natural cars, the unitarity violation uh, was cancelled by the introduction of a new object, which has to be a scalar uh, boson. Okay. So with spin equal zero, which in the standard model can only be the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. So once you introduce the Higgs boson, just for this reason, okay, just to cure the anomaly of this uh, decay, your, uh, your theory becomes consistent, your cross-section becomes physical, and your unitary regulation is gone, okay? So we have to uh, take into account also these two additional diagrams. Now, <clears throat> as we see today and uh, tomorrow, the Higgs me mechanism is based on uh, uh, the idea of the so-called spontaneous symmetry breaking, hmm? SSP. That I will try to illustrate now in a simple example. Okay, so consider uh, the bottom of an empty wine bottle, hmm? and suppose uh, you have a ball on the top of the hill here. Okay, so if the ball uh, is put on the top of the peak, then as you can see already from the picture, the system is completely symmetric with respect to rotations. Of the bottom, okay, is azimutally symmetric, okay. So, uh, so the potential, which is uh, filled by the, the ball, okay, is a rotationally symmetric with respect to the vertical axis. Mm -hmm. 
Suppose now that uh, uh, by a flat fashion, okay, uh, whatever, then the ball at a certain point, uh, this is an unstable situation. Still. So the ball tends to go down, to the hill, uh, downhill, and at a certain point, the, uh, the ball will, will, uh, will stop in a certain position in this minimum of the potential energy. Mm -hmm. So below a certain potential energy, so below some eight, the ball will spontaneously break this symmetry and will move into a specific point of the lowest energy level. Hmm? Indeed, choosing one of the possible infinite. We have infinite position here, infinite degenerate position in this mean here. Okay? By chance, by quantum fluctuation, the ball choose one of those. Okay? And one is, once this happens, then the symmetry is broken. The symmetry that you see in the second picture is not anymore symmetric under rotation with respect to the second axis. Okay? So we say that the symmetry has been spontaneously broken. What does this mean? Uh, let me put it here. So this means that the bottle, which is our Lagrangian, okay, maintain its rotational symmetry. It is still there. Okay? But the ground state of the theory, so the lowest energy level of our theory, does not anymore. Okay? Because the ball pick up just one possible final state. And so broke the symmetry. Hmm? So the symmetry is still there for the bottle, so for our Lagrange, but not for the ground state. This is what we call a, a, a spontaneously symmetry breaking. A spontaneous symmetry, uh, broken symmetry has the characteristic that a critical point must exist, okay? For instance, the, the eight of the, the hill in the bottle. Beyond this critical point, the symmetric solution becomes unstable, okay? And the ground state becomes asymmetric and degenerate, as in the, in the example of the bottle. Mm -hmm. More in general, one can suppose that uh, a physical system can be found in two different phases. The so-called unbroken phase, where the physical states are invariant with respect to all symmetry group for which the Lagrangian itself is invariant. And in this phase, as we will see, only massless gauge boson can exist. This is the case of the Lagrangian that I showed you before, the electric Lagrangian without mass terms. Mm -hmm. And then there is the spontaneously broken phase. So below a certain energy or potential energy, a phase transition might occur. The system reaches a state of minimum energy, the true vacuum or the ground state, in which part of the symmetries of the Lagrangian are lost or hidden. And when you apply this to a gauge theory, such as the electroweak theory or the standard model, then it turns out that, uh, as we will see, some of the gauge bosons become massive. Okay, and appear as physical state. Okay, so the spontaneous, uh, the spontaneous symmetry breaking is indeed the, uh, the medicine that we have to use to cure our electroweak Lagrangian. Okay, in order to make our bottom massive. What about the choice of the physical state? So the ball had indeed infinite possibilities here. Okay, everything is uh, uh, completely symmetric in the initial state. Okay. Then something happened, a quantum fashion, and the ball goes down and found a place. Okay. So uh, the choice of the physical vacuum state, okay, among the infinite possible ones, is determined by a quantum fashion occurring when the system is crossing the physical point. Okay? And in fact, uh, this is uh, the important point: infinitesimal fluctuation, quantum fluctuation of a system can decide the system fate. Okay the destiny, just by determining which branch to take it with respect to all possible branches. So we are all uh, children of a quantum plot version, if you like. OK, let's make a break. We cominciamo a 10. 10 and 10. We recombine at uh, 10 past 10.
Ok, ci siete da casa? Fate tra slide? Sì. Ok. All right. So we have uh, introduced in simple words uh, the concept of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Let's now see how this acts in practice. First of all, with a simple example of a real field, then with a more complicated example of a complex field, and then finally, the Higgs mechanism with a, a double complex field, field in a, as, as a weak, um, weak as a spin doublet. So uh, let's start from the simple case. <coughs> And in particular, let's start from the Lagrangian density for the klein gordon equation. Okay. If you remember, uh, the, uh, we derived the klein gordon equation okay, by substituting this Lagrangian into the Euler Lagrangian equation a okay, long time ago. So this is the Lagrangian for a free scalar field, mm -hmm. phi. It has a, a um, <coughs> kinetic term, which comes with the derivative, and a mass term, which is quadratic in the field. Okay, this is the standard. Now let's try to uh, generalize a bit this Lagrangian, and let me substitute this mass term with a more general potential energy term, okay, which still includes a quadratic term, and now in addition a, of a quartic term. Mm -hmm. So our Lagrangian density will become like this. So the quadratic term that we see here, that is introduced through this potential energy, can still represent the mass of a particle corresponding to an excitation of the scalar field. And the last term, which, is, which was with the fourth power of the field, uh, can be interpreted as a self-interaction of the scalar field with itself, okay? With a coupling constant, just one fourth of lambda, okay? So this is our starting point. Now, uh, we want to find the vacuum state. So the, the minimum energy level for this system, okay? And so what we have to do is to minimize this potential fun energy function, okay? So calculate the first and the second derivative and found where the minimum are. And it turns out, just by the way this potential is defined, that uh, we can have a finite minimum only if the lambda parameter is positive. Otherwise, you don't have minimum. You just calculate the first and second derivative and realize this, okay? So the first constraint is that the lambda parameter has to be positive. Now we have an additional parameter, which is mu. Okay, so we have also here some uh, possible choice to make. Suppose that the mu square is also chosen to be positive. Okay, now in this case, the resulting potential has a minimum at phi equals zero. Okay, so as a standard uh, shape like this. Uh, the, uh, in this case, the vacuum set corresponds to the field being zero, and the Lagrangian described indeed a scalar particle with a mass mu, okay, and a four point interaction proportional to the fourth power, okay. So, if let me go back here, if we take mu square positive, then this is the Lagrangian describing a field, okay, with, uh, which is zero at the minima and which uh, has uh, corresponds to uh, a mass given by this term, and a four-point interaction given by this other term. Of course, we can also make a different choice, that is mu square to be negative. Now, if we take mu square to be negative, then uh, we have a different kind of solution. Actually, we have, in this case, two real uh, solutions for the minima. So we have two minima. That we call uh, plus or minus v, which corresponds to this value, okay? So plus or minus square root of minus mu squared divided by lambda, okay? Clearly, the, uh, in the, this quantity here is positive because mu squared is negative, okay? However, in this case, mu can no longer be interpreted as the mass of the scalar field, okay? Because uh, mu squared is negative, so it's something strange. And in this case, the lowest energy state does not occur where the field is zero. This is instead a false, uh, false vacuum, okay? But rather, the field has now two non-zero vacuum expectation value, okay? So there are two possible solutions where the expectation value of the field in the vacuum are at a plus or minus b. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember the potential energy that we used, okay, this guy here, only contains uh, even powers of the field, either 5 to the square or 5 to the fourth power, okay? 
So, by construction, this uh, potential energy, and so the Lagrangian, uh, is symmetric for phi into minus phi. Okay? If you make this change, nothing happens in your Lagrangian. Okay? So, this is uh, the symmetry of this Lagrangian. Okay? Now, when we make the choice of the vacuum state, so either plus B or minus B, we are breaking the symmetry. Right? We are choosing one of the possible ones. So, the choice of the vacuum state breaks this symmetry spontaneously. Why spontaneously? Because the Lagrangian density still maintains its symmetry with respect to plus or minus, but the ground state of the theory does not anymore, because you pick up just one of the two. So we are breaking this symmetry. Okay? And this is done indeed spontaneously. Now, uh, without loss of generality, let's choose, for instance, the plus B solution. So suppose that uh, our ground state is here, okay? Corresponding to a value, an expectation value of our field equal to plus B. So two plus the square root of minus the square root of that, okay? Now, as we uh, mentioned before, um, particles in quantum field theory arise as excitation on the field, okay? So, oh, sorry. So let's see now what happens if we perturbate the system around its vacuum state, okay? So we can obtain this excitation by perturbating the field around V, okay? So we do this a perturbation eta around the vacuum that we just chose, okay? The plus B, for instance. So let's see now what happened in the blackboard. Erbona. <coughs> So, our field now is B plus this perturbation around the minimum. Okay, and so let's now substitute this into our Lagrangian. So, the Lagrangian is in general, the Lagrangian density is one half, the derivative. And then we have the potential parity, minus one half u squared p squared minus one four lambda p four. Okay, so let's now substitute these everywhere. Okay. So this is one half, and it has the derivative of d plus eta x. Now, the V is just a number, it does not depend on space time coordinates. So, the derivative of V is just zero. Okay, so the only part of the matter is now this header. So this initial part just reduced to what half the V eta, the V eta. Now we have minus one half V square, V square plus two V eta plus X minus one four lambda and I have to develop this so it is v to the four plus four times v square theta plus six v square square plus four v theta cube plus theta Let's now make all these explicit. Okay, so the first term remains. Okay, now we have minus one half mu square v square minus mu square 
i muskler i alta. Det er så faktisk jo muskler i alta. Minus one half muskler i alta. Minus one half lambda b to fourth. Minus lambda b to alta. Minus three half. Lambda b square of the square minus lambda b of the cube minus one half lambda l. Now we remember that the vacuum. We need minus u square divided by lambda. So we can now express u square as minus lambda b square. And so let's substitute here. Minus one minus lambda b square b square minus minus lambda b square b alpha minus one half minus lambda b square x square minus lambda b cube theta minus three half lambda b square x square minus lambda b theta cube minus one fourth lambda x the fourth minus one fourth lambda b cube. <coughs> So we can now uh, sum up uh, terms. So this is a flash, then delta. Now we have just one half lambda e to the fourth plus lambda b cube theta plus one half lambda b square x square minus lambda b cube theta minus the half lambda b square x square minus lambda b theta cube Minus one fourth lambda theta b fourth minus one fourth lambda b. Ah, this guy here. So then we can. Uh, some of things. So this is equal to half, then theta, then theta. Now we have we can sum up uh, these here. We have a number of square root of one root. We get here. Okay. So in one half we might take out. So we need a uh, plus. One half times lambda b squared. Now we have this term here. Minus lambda b theta cube. And then we have this term here. 
And now we have some answer. Uh, one. This is the of course. Spero che non ho fatto errori, qualcuno mi ha guidato la scansione, poi eventualmente correggete. So let's now uh, try to interpret this in the slide. Okay. <clears throat> so this is our result, okay? So we are perturbating the field around the vacuum, okay? Introducing this perturbation eta. We put into our Lagrange, we made some uh, trivial algebra, and we obtain this expression here for the Lagrangian density, okay? Where we make use of this relation here, okay? Between the parameters. Okay, so let's now look what we have here. We have a term which is lambda b square eta square. So it is a term which is quadratic in eta. And so if you compare this with the standard uh, Lagrangian for a uh, scalar, uh, scalar boson, the klein gordon Lagrangian, you see that this term, which is quadratic in the field, corresponds indeed to a mass term, okay? So we can, so this term here in the Lagrangian, okay, has to be in the form of one half m square eta square, just like this one here. And so by equating these two objects, we can now obtain the expression of the mass of this new particle, which arises as an excitation of the field around the vacuum. Hmm? So we just invert this, and you think that the mass of this particle is square root of two lambda squared, or square root of minus two mu square, where mu square has to be negative. Hmm? Then what, uh, what else we have here? We have a term which is cubic and a term which is quartic in the field, and this corresponds to triple and quartuple uh, self-interaction terms, okay? In the Lagrangian, this guy here and this guy there. And then we have an object which is just a constant. This, are, this is just a number, okay? So we can just neglect this. It has no physical impact, okay? So in our Lagrangian, after perturbating the field around the vacuum, we obtain a mass term for this perturbation, so we, for this new particle. Hmm? and then triple and quartic uh, self-interaction terms. So after the spontaneous symmetry breaking, so after choosing one of the two vacuum states, okay, and after, after expanding the field around the vacuum state, the Lagrangian cannot be written in this term here. So we can collect the triple and quartuple uh, quartic interaction term into this uh, self-interaction potential, and then we have the mass term and the, uh, the kinetic term for this new particle, eta. Hmm? Is it clear so far? Okay, so this was the easy part. Let's now complicate our life and let's now consider a complex field, okay? So our field phi, phi is now uh, given by two real fields, which all together form a complex object. So phi one plus i phi two, okay? So in this case, now the Lagrangian would look like this. So since this is a complex number, we have to take into account now the complex conjugate here, here and there, okay? Now, uh, we substitute this field into the Lagrangian and, and at the end, we obtain something like this. So this is the, the starting point. So we have a kinetic term for phi one, a kinetic term for phi two, and then we have a quadratic term for phi one and phi two and a quadratic term. Mm -hmm. Now let's see, uh, let's look at this Lagrange and see what kind of symmetry does it has. Hmm? So let's consider, for instance, a global U1 transformation like this. Phi prime is E to I alpha phi, okay? The one we introduced already long ago. Hmm? So if this is the kind of transformation, then you can compute the phi prime star phi prime just by multiplying the two. And of course, uh, the exponential part uh, cancel in the product, okay? So it turns out that the product of the transformed field is the same as the product of the untransformed field. 
And so in other words, this Lagrangian is symmetric under global U1 transformation, okay? Now, as we did before, uh, for the simple case of a real field, uh, let's look to minima, okay? To the minimum of this potential, okay? And again, we can make two different choices, either mu squared positive, and so the minimum of the potential occur where both phi1 and phi2 are zero, or the other solution, mu squared negative, in this case, the potential has infinite minima, which lie in, this in the circumference with this equation here. And this you can visualize already here, okay? So the mu square, the positive mu square solution is uh, a potential like this, okay? Where we have a minima where both fields are zero. This is the lowest energy uh, level, so the true vacuum. In this case, where we take mu square negative, instead the minima, so the true vacuum are in this circumference here. So we have infinite possibilities around the circumference. And the false vacuum is instead the place where both fields cancel, okay? But it is not the minimum energy. Now, the physical vacuum state corresponds at the end to a particular point of this circle, okay? So the system by quantum fashion at the end will decide one, will pick up one of these possible uh, degenerate uh, uh, minimum state energy, minimal energy states along the circumference, okay? And the choice of the vacuum state among the infinite possibilities will cause the spontaneous breaking of the symmetry, okay? We choose one, so we are breaking the symmetry. In the sense that the Lagrangian is still symmetric under global U1 transformation, but the ground state of the symmetry is not anymore, okay? It is like when you are uh, at the restaurant, suppose you are in a round table in the restaurant, so you have your forks uh, on the left and the right. So usually people does not know which one to use. And as far as nobody touches the fork, uh, the symmetry is, uh, is there. But as soon as one of the hosts take the first fork, then the symmetry is broken and all the other are forced to take it, either one or the other, okay? Spontaneous symmetry break. Now, again, we have infinite possible choices, okay? Without loss of generality, as we did already before, let's pick up one. In particular, let's pick up the one uh, corresponding to um, a, a value, a non-zero value of the phi1 field, but a zero value of the phi2, okay? So a uh, point of coordinate phi1, phi2 equal v0, okay? So lying in this axis, in the phi1 axis, okay? And now the symmetry is broken, and we could do the same game as before. We can now perturbate the, the, the system around this minimum, okay? However, this time we have two fields, phi1 and phi2. So we have to perturb both around this uh, choice of the vacuum V. So for the phi1, this would be V plus the perturbation eta. Okay, so essentially we are, uh, we are fluctuating our field in this direction, phi1, okay, along the, uh, the phi1 axis, so in this direction, if you like, okay. For phi2, uh, since we are now in the phi1 axis, it is zero, plus or minus a fluctuation in this other direction, okay, the direction of phi2. Is it clear? So phi1 uh, has a fluctuation around v, and phi2 has a fluctuation around zero, because our vacuum state is v0. We choose this one, okay? So we can now put together everything in our field, so the real part would be now v plus eta, which is phi1, and the imaginary part is epsilon, which is the fluctuation of the phi2 field. Now, suppose we do the same exercise we did before in the blackboard, we will not do, of course. It is just a bit more complicated, but exactly the same uh, concept. At the end, you will find you obtain a Lagrangian like this, okay? Where we have a kinetic term for the eta particle, a kinetic term for the psi particle, which was the excitation of the second field here, phi2. Hmm, a mass term for the eta particle, and then we have an interaction term which takes into account the third and fourth power of the field. So these are self interaction terms. Okay. What is missing? You already see that there is no mass term for the field C. Okay. So if you do, you perform all the calculation, we find that you will get a mass term, so a quadratic term for the eta particle, but not for the C. So something is happening here. Let's start to understand a bit more. 
So this is our potential. We have infinite minima. We choose one minimum, and we are now fluctuating the field around this minimum. But there is an important difference between fluctuating in the phi one direction or along the phi two direction. The massive field eta, so the one that indeed gets a massive term in the Lagrangian, corresponds to radial excitation. So we are moving in the direction of the radius here, right? That is the direction where the field is changing, the potential is changing, sorry, right? Whereas, uh, and this corresponds to a physical object with a physical mass. Whereas the uh, field psi hmm, corresponds to tangential fluctuation around this point here. So along a direction where the potential is not changing. We are tangential, tangential to our two state. So the radial is where you have indeed your slope. So the potential is changing in this direction, but the potential is not changing in the other direction. Okay. As a result, this guy here, the xi, don't get an mass term and appears as an unphysical scalar boson that we call the Golds, a Goldstone boson. So it is there because it appears from the mathematics of our um, procedure, okay? But it does not correspond to a physical boson. However, it is there, it is unphysical, it cannot be measured, and so we have to do something to remove it, right? Otherwise, we have a problem here in hands. Now, let me first tell you the Goldstone theorem, okay? It is a fundamental theorem. So if a Lagrangian is invariant under a group of transformation G with N generators, hmm, and if there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking such that the new vacuum is only invariant under a subgroup of these transformations, okay? So with M smaller than uh, N generators, then the difference between the number of generators corresponding to the symmetry of the Lagrange and of the ground state corresponds to the number of unphysical massless scalar fields that appear, which we call Goldstone bosons. Okay? So suppose that uh, uh, your Lagrange uh, is symmetric under a group of dimension 5, and your ground state is symmetric under a group of dimension 2. Then three Goldstone bosons will appear. Okay, the difference. So in the previous example, the Lagrangian, the one that showed before, the Lagrangian had a global U1 symmetry. So there was just one generator, and the ground state had not anymore this uh, symmetry. So zero generator. One minus zero is one, and so we got one Goldstone boson. The psi, this guy here. Okay. Now. As I was mentioning in the very first slide today, or second slide, I don't remember, uh, a direct consequence of special relativity is that uh, the existence of a longitudinal polarization of of freedom is not possible for mass for particles moving at speed of light. Okay, so moving along the longitudinal direction, as like light for the photon. Okay, the photon cannot have a longitudinal polarization degree. Okay, therefore, particle with longitudinal polarization must be massive. Okay, it is a fundamental concept that I already gave you before. So let's now try to put everything together in this reasoning. Okay. And here is where the magic really comes. Okay. This magic is called a unitary gauge. So with an appropriate gauge transformation, which we will not do because it's very complicated. Okay, just trust me. This is called the unitary transformation. What happened is that the unphysical Goldstone bosons disappear from the Lagrangian. And their degrees of freedom are not lost. They are transformed into the longitudinal polarization state of the now massive gauge problems. Complicated. So we apply the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking to our system. We get uh, a, a real particle with mass theta and a Goldstone bottom, which is massless and unphysical. Okay? If this is done in a gauge theory, or not in general, but in a gauge theory, then through a special gauge transformation, which is called the unitary transformation, all the Goldstone bosons disappear from the Lagrangian, but their degrees of freedom are reabsorbed into the longitudinal polarization state of the now massive bosons. You see? And this is exactly what happened in the Higgs mechanism. So let me try to be more explicit here. <clears throat> 
The Higgs mechanism indeed operates in a gauge theory, which is the electroweak theory, okay, where all four gauge bosons, the photon, the W, and the Z, are originally massless. This is the problem that we have to cure. Hmm? They are massless and solely propagated at the speed of light. Now, the Higgs mechanism indeed requires four scalar bosons. Okay, three of them are Goldstone, okay, so unphysical, and through the unitary gauge can be uh, can be transformed to provide the longitudinal polarization the equilibrium of the three massive bosons, the W plus, W minus, and Z. Okay. The fourth scalar boson, okay, the Higgs boson, in fact, does not take place to this gain. It, it gets a mass, it is the mass, massive boson. So it is not a goldstone. And this is the reason why the photon, which is the fourth remaining boson, remains massless. Okay? There is no additional goldstone boson that can provide mass to the photon. So of the four scalar bosons, three are goldstone and provide the mass to the W plus, W minus Z, and one remains massive and real, and this is the Higgs boson, which we have to detect experimentally. Let me try to show this uh, graphically, okay? So we started originally from uh, mass, four massless mass -less bosons, W plus, W minus, Z, and photon, okay? Which only have, as you see, only transverse polarization states, okay? If these particles are moving along Z, they oscillate along X or Y, okay? So they are massless and they move at the speed of light. Now, this object interacts with the Higgs field, okay? Which is made by four scalar bosons. Three of these scalar bosons are Goldstone, and so they provide the longitudinal degree of freedom to the W plus and the minus and Z. So this guy here now become massive because they acquire this additional polarization state. Okay, the photon remains massless because nothing has happened here, and in addition we are left with a new object that it is predicted to be there, and so that we have to detect the Higgs boson indeed. Hmm? Massive and real. Now, a bit of history. <clears throat> uh, okay, this mechanism we will develop tomorrow, okay? This requires some effort, so this we will do tomorrow on the blackboard. Today I just wanted to, uh, let's say, give you the, the main picture. Hmm? Now, uh, some history. Uh, in the early 60s, the spontaneous symmetry break mechanism was already known and was applied to other fields, essentially in condensed matter, in particular to superconductivity and superfluidity. Okay? Uh, but it was never applied to the realm of elementary particles. So in other words, it was never applied to a gauge theory. Okay? And the difference is, is, is enormous because only in gauge theory you have this uh, unitary gauge that allows you to absorb the degree of freedom of the gauge bosons into the, the mass of the living particles. Okay? So, indeed, when they apply this theory to the superconductivity, uh, things were working uh, exactly, but they had, to be, they had these uh, non vanishing Goldstone bosons. There, there was no way to, to, to kill them, okay? because this was not a gauge theory. The Higgs mechanism, <clears throat> in the Higgs mechanism, the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a complex scalar field is embedded for the first time in the theory of the local gauge symmetry, which is the electroweak theory, which is based on the U1 SU2 uh, gauge symmetry. Okay. Now, the mechanism was proposed in 1964 by three uh, independent uh, groups. Okay. The first to publish were Brut and Engler. Okay. So they, they were the first to publish the idea, but in their paper, they focused on these uh, um, Goldstone bosons that are absorbed to provide the mass of the, of the gauge bosons, but they completely neglect about the massive boson, the Higgs boson. The second paper was the one by Peter Higgs, indeed, okay, who was the first, indeed, to mention uh, the existence of this new object, the Higgs boson, with a mass, so real object, and so measurable. And finally, these three guys, Gural, Nick, Higgins, and Kibble, were, uh, were the last to publish, but they provide the most clear and comprehensive description of the mechanism. So essentially, uh, it was a big effort carried independently by three groups, and all, all, these, all six guys here deserve the merit of providing this uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting to uh, to see how the uh, 
why the Higgs boson is called the Higgs boson. So we have six people here. So why does Higgs? Hmm? So the story is the following. Uh, similar to Brut and Hengler, uh, Peter Higgs, uh, in his original manuscript, also <coughs> was focused on this uh, transformation of the Goldstone bottles into the mass of the gas bottles. And so he also neglected the, the importance of this massive, remaining massive uh, stalag. Then he submitted the paper to physical review letters, and the paper was rejected by the editor uh, because uh, the article was too abstract and essentially was lacking of physical relevance. So Higgs had the idea, had two choices, first of all, maybe three choices. One, give up. Second, try to submit the same paper to a different journal and see if it's accepted. Or try to insist with physical regulators, which is a very prestigious journal, but of course, uh, making some change to the paper. And so he had the intuition that uh, in order to have the manuscript accepted by the editor, he had to put down something more concrete into the paper, apart from formulas and theories. Okay? And so, indeed, he had a new paragraph with a specific prediction to be tested experimentally, which is the existence of a new massive boson to be detected. Hmm? Then, physical electors accepted the paper, which is now this very famous paper from 1964. And indeed, Higgs was the first one to give the right importance to the boson, the massive boson, and that's why essentially today everybody speaks about the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. Now let's complete now the, the, the circle uh, by applying what we just learn, learned on the case of the Higgs mechanism. Okay, so applying the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking within the electroweak theory. So in this uh, minimal uh, Higgs model, okay, as we see, as we just said, we need four degrees of freedom because we have to provide mass to three bottles, the W plus, the W and Z, okay? And now, and, and these four degrees of freedom are introduced now in the electroweak theory in the form of a complex scalar field, okay, in the form of an isospin doublet. So this is a standard isospin doublet, L, where we have two components which differ by one unit of electron charge, like the neutrino and the electron, or, okay? But now each of those is a, a complex field, okay? So in total, we have four degrees of freedom, by one, by two, by three, by four. This is exactly what we need to make our gain. Hmm? Now, we start from our Lagrange. Clearly, now this is a vector of complex objects, so here we have to take into account the uh, admission conjugate, okay? Which enters here, here, and here, okay? Then uh, you look for the minima, and the minima are also in this case infinite, and all the it corresponds to all the infinite solution of this uh, um, hyper circumference in this four dimensional space. Okay. Now again, without loss of generality, we, we pick up one of the possible two vacuum. Okay, and to make things easier in the description, but of course this is relevant for the for the physics, we choose uh, as the vacuum. Uh, the vacuum expectation of the neutral scalar field phi zero. Okay, so here we have phi plus phi zero, and we take the, the situation where the vacuum is only affect only the, uh, the 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 neutral component. Okay, so this is the uh, vacuum expectation value for the Higgs field. Now we do what we know. So we perturb the field around this minimum. Okay. <coughs> And so we have to introduce uh, four perturbations, say one, say two, say three, and H. Say one, say two, and say three, okay, um, we become the Goldstone boson, as you, as you can already imagine. And X, uh, H is the Higgs boson, which is the one corresponding to a perturbation in the direction pick up by um, the, the two pick up from, from, the, from the choice of the value. So this is our field with the perturbation around these vacuum expectation value, okay? We have four scalar bosons to deal with. We apply the unitary gauge. And so after gauging away the three resulting dots and bosons, say one, three, and three, both degrees of freedom are now absorbed into the longitudinal polarization degree of the massive bosons. Then we are left with uh, the Higgs doublet in this form here, okay? 
case of zero in the upper component and B plus H, which is what is left here in the lower component. Okay. Now, the next step that we will do tomorrow is now to put this into the Lagrangian and see what happens when we look to quadratic terms on the gate bodies. And this is indeed the place where the masses arise naturally. Okay. So this will be the Salam Weinberg uh, Lagrangian that we derive tomorrow. Okay. Any questions? I mean, just a question about the, the form for the potential. I mean, we went to degree four or there, the square of the, the, the product of the, um, uh, the, the the conjugate and stuff, but couldn't we go to higher powers and have more solutions? Yes, indeed. This is, this is indeed the minimal uh, model. Of course, you can generalize these to any higher degrees of uh, number of dimensions, yes. This is the minimal, and this is what we need in the standard model, because in the standard model, we have three massive bosons and one Higgs boson. In the supersymmetric model, as we will study in the very last lesson, uh, there are four Higgs bosons, okay? So you need, of course, to work with higher dimensions. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, then we continue tomorrow. Close the registration.